Welcome back. Well, as you can see from the tail, which is going wild here, I have my baby back with me today. Say hello. Here. Up. That way. That way. Say hello. Apparently, he's not going to smile pretty for the camera. But yes, baby is back with me. He seems to have gotten over his weird adjustment period to the weather change because the last few days it's been in the 80s. So he's back in summertime mode, which means he wants to be up and playing instead of sitting across the room from me snoozing while the camera is running. But as we all know, he's the star. Camera needs to be on him. Okay. Today, I have a couple of things for you. Uh, I went to Bedford, um, and so we're going to have some antique shopping at thrift store prices. But I've also got something just a little bit different, and that'll be a surprise. I'll tell you when we come back. Well, before we went to Bedford, we went to the grocery store, and I actually filmed a little bit in there for you. And one of the first things I filmed is this. Okay, we're leaving. This is a little teensy-weensy baby hair clip. So, let's take a look. I've been looking for these for a long time. And believe it or not, I found them in a grocery store. They are teeny baby hair clips. And what I do with them is I stick my mask on the clip. I clip the mask on to my blouse. Easy peasy. I have a stash of these because my hair is very thin and very fine. And when it was longer, I would put clips in it, but I couldn't use those big adult size clips. I just don't have enough hair for it. So I took to getting baby clips. And my stash of baby clips has come in really handy for keeping the masks handy. Um, I do not wear masks when I am walking around the street or doing anything that uh, that I find exerting in any way because quite frankly I, I find it hard to breathe through a mask and if I'm doing something that requires any degree of physical exertion I need to take in as much as much oxygen as I can get and I don't need it you know filtered through fabric or paper or whatever but you never know who you're going to run into and as you all know most of my neighbors are elderly, so even working in the yard, I will keep something like this handy because I don't want the responsibility of making someone in their 80s sick. Yeah, I can live without that one. So, I found some at the grocery store. Uh, next thing I ran into at the grocery store, take a look. Well, it's a sign of the times. We've got a whole stack of them here. Wow, brave new world we're living in. Here is a special pen so that you don't actually have to touch anything with your fingers. I, wow, I'm, world's getting scary. Uh, the thing that surprises me the most is there's actually a market for something like this. I would have thought anybody who is afraid to touch things would either wear gloves or bring their own pen to go poking stuff with. But no, apparently we've got a whole new post-COVID industry here of, look, new pens so you don't have to touch things with your fingers. Well... 
Anyway, I got a kick out of that, so I thought I would share it with you. And finally, the third thing at the grocery store. And this one came up because we are moving into fall. And as you all know, I'm from New England. So, here we go. All right, a little bit of weirdness that I see in every store. These are the baked beans. Beans, 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 beans. Take a look at what's down here. Hidden away at the very bottom. All right, here's our aisle. And right down here at the very bottom is our brown bread. No, it's not in the bread aisle. It's always under the beans. Yes, brown bread is sort of a Boston tradition. It's a boiled bread. If you've never tried it before, get a can someday. It's, uh, it's somewhere between a really soft gingerbread cookie and um, one of those dense, uh, like, walnut breads or quick breads. That's what they call them. Somewhere in between. Uh, traditionally, you would mix up your brown bread and throw it either into a can, a jar, or even uh, wrap it in gauze and boil it. That's how they're made. It's not a baked bread. But yes, if you want your brown bread for Thanksgiving, which I do, that's a Boston thing, you got to have your brown bread um, and your cranberry sauce and you know, your mashed carrots, and if you're from Boston, there's a whole list of stuff that has to be on your Thanksgiving table. I don't need to tell you, you already know, brown bread is one of them, and, you know, this is where you're going to find it. You find the brown bread in the beans aisle. Go figure, because I have no explanation. Anyway, I thought you'd get a bit of a kick out of that because I certainly had fun looking around the grocery store for interesting things to film for you, um, which I did just, you know, because I was there. Uh, and then we went straight off to Bedford. Uh, the first place I went was that little booth. As you walk in the door, the booth is on your right, just past the register. And it's not even small. It's just sort of a large area that is not enclosed the way booths are. It's just a sort of open area. And I have found the most interesting things in there. Total mixed bag. There are some things I look at and say, where are they getting their prices from? This is like crazy out of their minds. And then I go in and I start finding dollar deals. So let's take a look at my first batch of dollar deals. So back to the little booth in the front that I usually check out first. Let's take a close up on this. Pretty little ring box, Japan. And you can see how tiny and delicate this little thing is. And here's our price, one dollar. Oh yeah, coming home with me. Same little booth, very pretty Japanese basket. One dollar. So, here, there's our Japan marking. So, that's coming with me too. Same booth. This is a really pretty Mexican planter. Um, One dollar. Now, there's an issue with this. There's a little hole here, which appears to be a firing flaw. Um, I am not concerned about that because that is a very convenient drainage hole. So that is coming with me. Well, the little ring box is just adorable. That is so cute. It's going to be the easiest thing in the world to ship. And I have found 
that people like those very tiny trinket boxes. I'm not sure what they do with them. I know what I would do with them. If I were a grandmother, I would use it for baby teeth. Um, you know, if I had, uh, if I, if I had a person, um, I don't know. I'm trying so hard to be politically correct here. If I had a person with whom I had a relationship and I wanted to give them a ring, I would stick it in a box like that. You know, they're just, they're endlessly useful. And any kind of tiny little gift tucked in a box like that suddenly becomes a much bigger gift. I find that little boxes like that don't last 10 minutes in my Etsy shop. Somebody always wants them. Uh, the handled candy dish is a beautiful piece. Uh, old line Nippon styling. And I will have to check the label and see if that is Japan or Nippon. In the film, I said it was Japan, which means it probably was marked Japan, meaning post-World War II. Uh, in general, now keep in mind that it had to say Japan as of 1919, so post-World War I. But in general, the Japanese were using the Nippon designation pretty much interchangeably with the Japan designation right up until the beginning of the Second World War, at which point we were cut off from Japanese imports for very obvious reasons. The only thing they imported was a fleet of bombers to Honolulu. So what can I say? Um, after that, everything was marked occupied Japan for a period of seven years, and then Japan. And that is still true today. It's still, it's Japan written in English for an English speaking import market. So that piece I'll have to check. Uh, very pretty. Just so surprising that a piece that nice is a dollar. You can't argue with the fact that we're talking thrift store prices. The Mexican planter, um, and I believe that was $3. I, I'm sure I showed you the price in the film, but I seem to recall three. That piece, of the three pieces I got in that booth, that is the least valuable. That's the one that will have the lowest resale price on it. Um, that is just a nice, useful, attractive planter. Um, I was not at all daunted by the little hole in the bottom because with a planter like that, which is clearly heavy clay suitable for use outdoors, you're going to want a drainage hole anyway. So it's like, hey, they saved me the trouble of drilling it. Um, and because I have some plants to go over to my neighbors, uh, you know, I may end up just popping them in the planter and bringing the whole thing over. For $3, that can very easily just get assigned as a gift to a neighbor. Frankly, for $3, you could give that to your worst enemy and not feel the pinch. But I did want to show you that we are talking thrift store prices. There's no two ways around it. There are some thrift stores in our area that are pricing at a dollar or so. Not many. Even most of the thrift stores are doing minimums of three to five. So, super, super prices. And that's why you should never discount antique malls when you're bargain shopping. It all depends on who's running the booth, what they've got, and what their pricing schema is. In this case, as I say, some things are you just away in the stratosphere, other things they're practically giving away. But I've noticed that that seems to be a pattern with stores that have super good prices. I don't think they do a lot of research. I think they price them maybe for what they paid for them. Maybe they're just PFA is what I call it, plucked from air. Ah, I think that's worth a dollar. Stick a dollar on it. 
Other times they'll look at something, I think that's worth 50 and you know, you're thinking to yourself, did you get that out of the trash? You never know. Those, however, are the shops where you can get your best bargains. Um, right over my head on this, you can see a little uh, vase. Uh, that is a rose medallion vase that I picked up for, I believe it was $10. I, it was in a video. I believe it was $10 I picked up in one of those booths where they're pricing something sky high and practically giving away the really valuable pieces. As I say, you find those booths, you remember them, you go back, that's where you will get super bargains. So let's see what's up next. Oh yes. The last time I was at Bedford, I shot some film of this piece. I showed it to you. There was no price on it, so it didn't come home with me. There was a price on it this week. Take a look. Okay, remember this pink and black uh, planter that I photographed the last time I was here and said there was no price on it. Bingo, we've got a price. This is beautiful. We've got a highly desirable combination of mid-century colors here. In a planter like this, it's more about the colors than the actual style of the planter. If you see pink and black, whoa, mid-century. And mid-century items sell well. Now that piece, and I mentioned this when I was filming, if you look at the style of the piece alone, just the embossed design, the, um, the edge, uh, the, just the lines of the piece, and discount the color completely, you're not going to say mid-century. You're going to look at that and you're going to say, okay, you know, American traditional 30s, 40s. Most likely, that's when that particular mold was made. So, a piece like that prior to the mid-century probably would have been made in those lines and might have been painted or had decals. They were getting into decals in that period. Most of the work was hand-painted still, but decals were becoming a thing. And, you know, you'd have that floral design to go along with the scrolls and the curly cues and, ooh, so 1940s, sort of the legacy of the influence of Art Nouveau with all of the swirls and the flourishes. Well, you get a piece like that, you fire it in pink and black, and all of a sudden, this quasi Art Nouveau piece has become identifiably mid-century. Pink and black were such classic mid-century colors in combination together. Um, pink is not necessarily a mid-century color, Black is not necessarily a mid-century color, no. But in combination, that is Elvis Presley with that hot pink shirt he used to wear and the black jeans and, you know, his pink Cadillacs and whatever else have you. And that was mid-century. So that piece is, as I say, identifiably, it's iconically mid-century which is fantastic because getting a nice deal on it at six dollars that is a nice deal i'm not going to say that that's quite as good as you know a beautiful nippon handled candy dish for a buck but still you can't discount that as a really good deal at six dollars i'm going to be able to put that into my Etsy shop at a very reasonable price and it's not going to last. That is the sort of thing that people really love. So, you see something like that, remember pink and black in combination, 
then mid-century scoop it up all right next i stopped over at the lutz booth uh, the owner of Lutz was there at the time we spoke for a while. She's a lovely, lovely lady. And uh, I, I really enjoy talking to her because she is so knowledgeable. And as I've said before, when I've been filming at Lutz, their identifications are spot on, I would say, 99% of the time. I have caught them calling East Lake Victorian once in a while. But to be fair... Eastlake is uh, within the Victorian era, 1890s. That's, that is the Victorian era. So I can't say they're wrong. They're just not quite as precise as I would be if I were doing it. On the other hand, I love Eastlake. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to go out of my way for that Eastlake identification. But in any event, she's wonderful to talk to. She really is. The next time get to Lux. Um, I'm going to see if I can't have her available because I'll, all I have to do is just arrange my trip when she's in the store sometime and talk to her on camera because she's a wealth of information. Her family has been doing this for some time. Lux is a family-owned business. So certainly if you want information on large case pieces as you know that's what Lutz specializes in she's a wealth of information so if you're interested let me know and i will see if i can get her on camera because i have no doubt that would be really really interesting for all of us uh, so let's take a look at uh a piece that was in there. Uh, this piece was in there the last time I was at Lutz too. However, um, I didn't film it because I was busy filming that beautiful kitchen table. So take a look at this piece. Very interesting. All right, we are in the Lutz shop. And this is their little booth at Bedford Antiques. And this wonderful little cabinet here, this is 225. So I had to back up so you could see the whole thing. But let's move in a little closer for some of the details. Remember the broken bonnet high boys that we talked about? This is a style that is... Um, it's intended to call that to mind. Now, let's see what they say. 1930s, here we go. Like I say, they, they are really good at their identifications. So, this is uh, a revival piece. Uh, during the 30s and 40s, Chippendale revival was big. Gothic revival was big. This piece is just beautiful. Um, in addition to that, not quite broken bonnet top. The fretwork in here is very Chippendale. Um, it's really a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. It's the sort of thing if you needed a small china cabinet, you couldn't do better than this. I really, really like those 30s and 40s revival era pieces. The piece that we just saw, the one that I filmed, has touches, influences of the Chippendale. Now, mind you, Chippendale had a broken bonnet. That had an unbroken bonnet, um, which was more popular in the Queen Anne period. But the Chippendale fretwork... And that is uh, like a jigsaw cut piece of wood. It's like all one piece of wood, that fretwork, just got the cutouts. And that's laid on the underside of the glass. So that's how, how you get that. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons that when you find cabinets like that, that wooden fretwork is usually in such good condition because it's protected by the glass. That little cabinet was probably five feet tall 
I'm thinking it was probably a couple of inches shorter than me. I'm five foot six. So a piece like that will fit anywhere. That is, um, it's a small scale version of the large scale china cabinets and buffets. Beautiful piece. I'm not sure if it was intended to be a china cabinet, a display cabinet, or, and I would sort of bet on this, a bookcase that would have gone into uh, the corner of a parlor or some other small room. 30s and 40s pieces like that are so undervalued these days and have been for a long time. They have not yet come into their own. I expect they will in the next 20 to 30 years when they become antiques themselves. They're beautifully made. The styles, although not true to type, that style was a bastardization, a little bit of Queen Anne, um, Sheraton on the legs, the Chippendale fretwork, you know, um, the handles were very Sheraton or Hebel white. Uh, if you started pulling them apart, you'd see a whole plethora of 18th century influences on the piece. Nevertheless, it was put together well. It was done well. Revival piece. They're made of solid wood. They usually have dovetail drawers. They have very well made cases. In other words, um, it's not simply nailed together. They have rabbits going in where the wood joins up. They are, uh, you know, frankly, a carpenter's dream come true when it comes to how they are put together. Beautiful, strong, sturdy pieces. And some of them, like the piece we saw, are just lovely. They put these little styles that they bastardized, they put the elements together very well. In this case, scaled down for mo modern, smaller homes. Great piece. That is absolutely something that if I had the room for, I would scoop up. <sighs> but even a piece that small is... You know, I don't quite have the room for it. Ouch. But I do love it. All right. Next, I went over to that darling little booth I go into all the time. And the reason I go in there, and you know this because I've said it many times, it's clean. It's neat. Um, I have never walked into that booth thinking, gee, i got to wash my hands on the way out. Uh, and I have also found some really good deals and some really interesting items in there. So, two pieces I found in there today. Neither one of them are coming home with me, but I did want you to see them. Well, we are back in that delightful little booth that I always go to because it's always so clean and neat and well organized. And I spotted this. Now... This is a little more than I would be interested in paying, even with the 20% off at 1850. Lefton. Now, that was one of the companies that did importing from Japan. And if you will recall, last time I was here, I got a very nice little footed candy dish that was, in fact, Lefton as well. So this one is going to go back where it came from because it is not coming home with me. But there is something that I want you to see in this shop. All right, let's take a look at that. This is a beautiful old sewing machine. Eldridge. The model is B. Uh, Parts and Original Owner's Manual. That's how it works, by the way. Those coffins, and that's what this part is called, the sewing machine coffin. The coffins were often hinged. Sometimes they just lift it off. And here you go. There's your sewing machine. They have all these wonderful little drawers. And... 
There we go. And they, they operate by the pedal. Very interesting piece. We are not taking it because it is three sixty nine. Nonetheless, it's really gorgeous, and I did want you to have a chance to see that. Okay, so what did you think of that sewing machine? That stuff is just, it's furniture, it's just beautiful. Uh, the uh, machine, the table that the machine was on was oak. The coffin, that's that part that drops over the machine, was oak beautiful the name of uh, eldridge and the model b that and that was a decal by the way it's sort of an embossed decal on it that was in really good shape this is probably a one owner piece because the original owner's manual was with it so nice piece not coming home with me uh, i have my hands full with sewing machine coffins today and I will tell you about that when we're through with this. So, up next, we have a very interesting little piece that I passed on and another interesting piece that came home with me. Let's take a look. Interesting piece here. $10. It's a lusterware ashtray with a dog. Well, these old ashtrays, believe it or not, actually have a good resale value and can, can command some very good prices. But this, $8, this is a little celluloid box. Let me, there are some marks on the lid here and here that suggest the piece might have been hinged at some point. Nothing over here, see? Uh, but I can find no indication that that was ever the case. So I am going to go with the idea that this particular piece of celluloid was designed for both a hinged and unhinged lid. $8 is a little high compared to what I usually pay for pieces like this. But because it's a jewelry box and because this velvet lining is in such good condition, I am taking it. So the little lusterware puppy dog ashtray I passed on. Was it a reasonable deal? Yes. For what it is, absolutely well below retail. At retail, I would expect a piece like that to go for $20 to $30, depending on whether or not I could identify the breed of the dog. And that's, maybe I can, maybe I can't. Sometimes, you know, it's like if it's a Scotty or an Airedale or something like that. Um, dog collectors, wait. That makes it sound like they collect dogs. Oh, sometimes they do. But when people have a Scotty dog or a Cocker Spaniel, they often collect little Scotty items or little Cocker Spaniel items or little Airedale or German Shepherd items. Those people, those very specific collectors, like pieces with little dogs like the ones they own. Perfectly normal. It can be expected of people. So, for a collector who uh, wants to buy it because it's a cute piece and it has their dog on it, it might go up to $30. Uh, I would estimate average retail on that uh, online on a site like Etsy or eBay would be about $20. Lusterware ashtray. Ashtrays are becoming really collectible. I know, you're thinking, well, society is getting stuck and it's just, it's becoming unpopular these days. Why would ashtrays be such a big thing? Well, society is pretty much against smoking, so ashtrays are becoming a thing of the past. And 
for some people, they are reminders of the good old days, you know, sitting, you know, watching Leave it to Beaver with Grandpa smoking in the chair next to you. I'm not really sure why. Um, obviously, the fact that, that getting an ashtray today is not as easy as it was in the 1950s when half the population of the country smoked. But that scarcity level, maybe that's it. I don't know. But I passed on that piece. I, but I have to be clear, I'm not saying to you, I think you ought to pass on a piece like that. If you find a nice vintage ashtray at a good price, scoop it up. There is absolutely a resale market for it. Make no mistake about it. They are hot commodities. The celluloid jewelry box, on the other hand, did come with me. Now, it needs to be washed and so on and so forth, but that velvet lining is in very good condition. A uh, celluloid jewelry box like that is going to date back probably to the 1950s. That makes it a nice vintage piece. Celluloid has its own collector's market. Jewelry boxes have their own collector's market. You put the two together and you have a piece that's going to have a wide appeal, especially that. And here's what you look for. The lining. In that case, the velvet lining was in really good shape. It wasn't rubbed. Yes, it's going to have to be wiped up and so on. But, you know, everything you buy in places like this have to be taken home, wiped up, and so on. That's part of what you do in order to justify your markup. People are going to scoop pieces like that up. So, the jewelry box, yes. The ashtray, no. Uh, would I have grabbed the ashtray if it were priced lower? Absolutely. Okay, so that is just the first half of the Bedford Shopping. I have another half that I am going to put together for you. Um, I think that's about it. You got a chance to see my local grocery store. You got a chance to see my kitty's tail, uh, which, of course, he wants to show off to anybody who'll look at him. And we've got Halloween coming up. And I am going to be dressed up for Halloween next weekend. This is just your heads up. I'm dressing up as Audie. Audie is supposed to be dressing up as me. But I'm having a really hard time keeping the glasses on him. So, if anybody has any suggestions on how to put a pair of eyeglasses on a squirmy little cat, let me know. In the meantime, um, check your subscriptions. Yeah, um, if you are subscribed, fantastic. Thank you. If you are not subscribed, please subscribe, like the video, etc. And the reason I'm mentioning this is, as I mentioned before, YouTube periodically goes through phases where either uh, by accident or by design, subscriptions are dropped. Perhaps they want people to make sure they're still current. I don't know. But a subscription, frankly, is not the fire and forget thing it once was. Nowadays, you have to make sure you're continuously subscribed. So, please, subscribe, like, and let's take a look at our horizon pictures. And let us calm down, smile, and take a few minutes to walk away from the mask clips and the safety pokey pads. And just try to focus on life is beautiful instead of how crazy out of control it's getting. All right, stay safe. I will see you tomorrow.